Thank you. It's good to be back. The people's good manager. What makes this happen? I just, uh, they made me pound down 20 push-ups backstage. I love that. I'll tell you something. I'm going to kick this off with one thing. I was talking to Charlie, right, the podcast upstairs before he came down here. I am sick and tired of talking about Joe Biden. I really am. And this is important for this year because, first of all, he's not really the president of the United States. Let's start with that. He is a puppet for the managerial class in the deep state that sits underneath. But number two is, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna say this for the last year, I'm gonna call it tonight. He is not going to be the Democratic nominee that we're running against in this year's election either. You better get ready for somebody else. And so the reality is, what the heck are we going to do about it? If speculate who it's going to be, forget about that. What we need to answer right now, and this is my charge to you, this is why I'm here today, is I am worried we are about to have another red wave that never comes in the year 2020. Complacency is not an option this year. That is why my message to you today is we got to ask ourselves who we are as Americans. Who are we as conservatives? Who are we as citizens of this nation? What does it mean to be a citizen of the United States of America in the year 2024? It means we believe in the ideals of 1776. That is what it means to be in America. 2024 is 1776 in the United States of America. And you guys are like the revolutionaries who fought that revolution. A lot of young people, that's why I love coming to these turning point events. It's going to be your generation that actually saves this country like it did the first time around. We are done obsessing with what the left puts on us. They're good at this. They'll give you some vision. They'll give you something to work with. Race, gender, sexuality, climate. And we're sitting here criticizing them without offering an alternative vision of our own. What do we actually stand for? The individual, the family, the nation, and God. Be race, gender, sexuality, and climate. If we have the courage to actually stand for something. What does it mean to be an American? It means we believe you get ahead in this country, not on the color of your skin, but on the content of your character and your contributions. That's what I'm right in the eye and affirmative action across this nation. We are done. It means we believe in the rule of law. And I say this to the kid of two legal immigrants to this country. That means your first act of entering this country cannot break the law. And that is why we will use our own military to secure our own southern border and our northern border. That's why we need to stand for the rule of law in the United States of America. And you know what? We have the largest influx of illegal migrants into this country in American history. Then yes, we will have the largest mass deportation in American history. for sanctuary cities. Stop working over our money to Central America until they have sealed their own borders. And you know what? You're not supposed to say this one, but I will. End birthright citizenship for the kids of the illegals. of this country. That's the first mass deportation that we need. But don't forget about the second one. This is what starts on day one of the second Trump term, I believe, is the mass deportation of three million federal bureaucrats out of Washington, D.C. That's the Shut it down. You can't reform these agencies. 
Syracuse. You want to get in there and Alfreda, shut it down. The manager of class, this is a war in this country. And I don't call this a war like, like war is one of these things that speaks itself into existence. But I mean this in a deep sense. We are at war as we were in the American Revolution. It is not between Democrat and Republican. It is not between black and white or man and woman or gay and straight. No. This is a war between the managerial class in the deep state and the everyday citizen in this country. This is a war between both of us, who love the United States of America and our founding ideals, and those who hate this country and what we stand for. And right now, more than ever, we need a commander-in-chief who will lead us to victory in this war. And that man is your 47th president, Donald J. Trump. It is going to take a fight. It is not going to be 
the man, the man you're going to hear tomorrow night is not just going to be Donald Trump coming from on high down to save us. He's going to do his part. I promise you that. I promise you whatever it is, I will do my part to save this country. But if we're going to save this country, it's going to be because we save ourselves. Every one of us, every one of you doing your part as our founding fathers did in 1776. This isn't somebody else's job. This is your job this year in your country to reclaim it. That is who we are. And if we do, then I will look my two sons in the eye and tell them and mean it that this is still the country where no matter who you are or where your parents came from or what your skin color is or how long your last name is, that you will still get ahead in this country with your own commitment and dedication without fear and that whatever your God-given potential is, you have the chance to achieve it in the United States of America. That is who we are. Thank you, God. God bless you. It is actually the U.S. taxpayer, all of us, 
who is funding Azerbaijan to actually do it. That's the, that's the ugly underbelly of the whole thing is our own taxpayer dollars are paying for it. So the irony is everybody who's somehow in the Ukraine caucus, which is the most popular political party in the United States of America, apparently, is, doesn't have a peep to say about actually the real human rights travesty that we're responsible for funding. So here's my belief. It's controversial, but I'll say it anyway. The first and sole moral duty of U.S. elected leaders is actually to the citizens of the United States of America. And we stand with our allies by not funding the very people who are trampling over them. And you have 120,000 reasons for me to continue to talk about this issue, as I will, and I'm hoping to travel to Armenia later this year to actually make the point. So thank you, my friend. I'll invite you. Come with me. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Great to see you. What besides pray is the most important thing we young people can do for our country? I'll give it to you. How old are you, says young people? I'm 14. You're 14 years old. Give it to me, young or I'm So I'll tell you, right now, I think we have a culture of fear in this country. Spread like an epidemic faster than COVID-19, okay? All 60 directions. COVID, maybe it'll spread a little bit of cough this way. Fear spreads all directions. Here's my ask of you. When you find yourself in a room, and you are the only person who believes what you do, I'm going to ask you today to stand up and say it. Say it with a spot. And say it with conviction. But part of respecting your neighbor and your friend is to tell them what you actually believe. And if you do that, you know what? Fear has been infectious, but courage can be contagious to this country. It just requires more people like you to actually step up and show it. So yes, pray, number one. And number two, speak your mind and don't apologize to anybody for it. That's really what it means to be a young American. Individual, family, nation, and God. It's not a four-letter word. And part of what's happened is the same way we apologize for our own nation in the United States of America, I think a lot of Christians have been taught to apologize for who they are or what their faith actually is. That's part of the reason. The question about Armenia, the last guy was standing where you are, the reason you don't hear about the Armenian human rights catastrophe is because the victims in that case are actually Christians. And the reality is, you need to stop apologizing for your beliefs. We all need to. I'm, I'm Hindu. You know this. I believe in one true God. I believe he puts us here for a purpose. But I will say it's a lot harder to be any faith than any other faith that's harder to be today in the United States is to actually be Christian. Because you're taught that you're supposed to apologize for your beliefs. And I reject that. Our founding fathers rejected that. And so part of this is that it requires some sacrifice. Even when it's not popular to say, tell people why you believe in God. Tell you, tell people why you believe in Christ. Tell people why you live the life the way you actually do. And embody that by example. And here's what I see, especially young people. You said you're 18. A lot of young people are quietly hungry for something bigger. Right? They've been served social media algorithms. They've been served other religions. Wokeism, transgenderism, climatism, COVIDism, globalism. Fauciism, you go straight down the list. These are, the climate religion in particular, why do you see people bending the knee to you know, Greta Thunberg being some type of modern Joan of Arc figure? It's because if you stop believing in God, you're going to believe in some other false idol instead. You might as well believe in the real thing. And I'm going to ask you to make sure you're expressing your belief to get other people the permission to express theirs too. Thank you, my man. I appreciate it. Hi, Vivek. Great to see you again. Uh, my name is Tyler Steinkran. I'm a 24-year-old from Washington, 
Michael Jeshi, the Township Trustee. I had the opportunity to ask you this question once and bumped into you in the hallway, but your answer was very inspiring, and I want you to share that with any young people out here who are considering running for office. My question to you was, I'm the youngest person in my race. You were the youngest person in your race. How did you use your youthfulness to your advantage? Well, I, look, I used it. I don't, I don't remember what we said in the hallway necessarily, but I'll tell you what I believe off the, off the bat right now is our founding fathers were people whose best days in life were still ahead of them, actually. Thomas Jefferson was 33 when he wrote the Declaration of Independence. That's five years younger than me. If I could run for president at the age of 38, imagine Thomas Jefferson starting an entire nation at the age of 33. Alexander Hamilton was a decade younger even still. If you think about the last 20 years of misplaced public policy, foreign wars that didn't advance our interests, racking up $34 trillion of national debt that your generation now bears on its shoulders, you know what, you've got to take it into your own hands to say, you're going to be the generation that pays the price for those mistakes. You're going to be the generation that bears the responsibility for getting us out of it. So if our founding fathers could do it in 1776, then it's just as true today that it will take somebody like you whose best days in life are still ahead of you to see a country whose best days are still ahead of itself. And if you do, then I'm confident our best days will actually still be ahead of us now. Good luck. I'm excited to be here. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Right here. Good afternoon, Michigan. Good afternoon, Vivek. I just want to say your media team and all the social media, TikTok, YouTube, and everything you do, you've done a wonderful job getting your message out to the youth, to the younger demographics, to the broader conservative audience, the broader conservative figures. Who can they do to better grasp that younger demographic that we all know is so important to the future of this country? So here's what I see, actually. I I've, I've talked a lot of good Republican politicians. I, I think a lot of them are actually, I don't say this derisively, I just think it's true. They're actually scared of interfacing with people from the next generation. And part of what we've got to realize is both sides of that have some fear in them. But I think a lot of young people in this country right now are lost, hungering for meaning and purpose at a moment when faith in God and belief in your country, belief in yourself, the belief in your family has disappeared. And yet, you have people from an older generation of political leaders who look at those young people who are sometimes screaming their beliefs, not because they actually believe them, but because they're lost and hungry for actual direction. Hi. Go into their shells. Say they're not going to come to a college campus unless the questions are free screen. And so I think that that gets us into this vicious negative cycle. So my answer to my fellow Republican leaders, I did tell the Democrats the same, Democrats Democrats same thing too, but this is for our own party. Is show up where you're not supposed to. Show up without fear. If you want to lead a country, lead the entire country, young and old, black and white. Not 100% of people are going to agree with you, but that's okay. And that's what I respect about what Donald Trump's doing now in this phase of the campaign. Go to the South Bronx. Look at where the People's Convention here is right now, in the middle of hard blue Detroit, in the cities of this country. If you show up for people, the people will show back up for you. America first includes all Americans. And if we embrace that message, I think we have a chance to win this Thank you, man. I appreciate the question. So, as someone who has grown up in the public school system, I'm about to have my senior year, and I'm so sick and tired of seeing the corruption in administration and their willingness to bend over backwards for these leftist ideals. What can I do to help stand up when it feels like everyone in power is so against? Well, look, I think that a lot of the people like the Congress, let's start with the rules of the road here. We have lost our sense of citizenship in this country. Right? We don't pledge allegiance to our own country anymore, not really. And that's why I stand by a position I adopted last year. I think every high school senior should be able to pass, and should have to pass, the same civics test that every immigrant has to pass to become a voting citizen in this country. You can't have conflicting loyalties. You can't have a loyalty to your pocketbook while you're actually governing this country. And the trading of individual stocks for the bureaucracy and for Congress. And the lobby for 10 years or more after you left the government. You shouldn't be 
able to lobby that government. That's the source of the corruption. But here's my view is, and I don't think we should have dual citizenship for people who are serving in public office either. That's also something to cut the issue. But I believe it. But I think what you're going to see is if we see our public officials demonstrate greater loyalty to our own citizens, then our citizens will actually start pledging loyalty and allegiance to our nation once again. And I think those two things are going to work together. So the first part comes first. Send somebody who's a real outsider into the White House back to the White House this time around and to clean the House this time. And then it's going to be bottom up. Your generation to step up and say, okay, you guys are doing your part. Now as a young person, I'm going to step up and do mine and actually pledge allegiance to make the sacrifices needed to save our country. So thank you very much. I appreciate that question. Last two, and then I think we're done. I would say, don't worry about building your experience to go into politics. Build the muscle of figuring out how you succeed in any way, inside politics or out. You see, this is the thing that we fall into the trap of sometimes. I fall into this trap. Every one of you here, a few thousand of you in the audience right now, every one of you has your own God-given gifts. They're not the same as the person sitting next to you. They're not the same as me, and they're not the same as you. Figure out what is your unique God-given gift. Look yourself in the mirror tonight when you go home and say, what gifts have I been given that nobody else has? And then figure out how you use those gifts to do what is right for this country and for yourself in the short time you're given. You do that, you know what? You can drive your change through politics. It might be through business. It might be through university education. We're going to need to fix all of them to save this country. And I'm going to count on you to get that job done. Thank you very much. There's somebody here. How illegal immigration hurts our industry, hurts our jobs, and why they should turn to the Republican Party uh, instead of staying with the Democrats as the UAW tells us to. Sure, the real people we need to be picketing are the people in charge of the current federal government that has given us the flailing economy that leaves every one of those union members holding the bat. So here's my, here's my message. It's not to the union leadership, but to the union membership of this country. Illegal mass migration is eroding our national foundation of who we are. We've got the, we got the rule of law thrown out the window. But all of those open American jobs are now actually being taken by people who crossed this border illegally, rather than those who worked hard and got it done the right way around. So when you agree with the Republican Party on every element of its policy plank, of course not. That's fine. You don't have to agree with 100% of what Donald Trump says or what the Republican Party says to be able to still say that, you know what, that's the party that's standing for American citizens in this country. You as union members are our fellow citizens, and America first means putting the citizens of our country, including those union members, first. That's my message to your brothers and sisters. Thank you, Brad. Thank you. Thank you. Right there. We have a question right there. Yes. And I just want to say thank you for coming and really appreciate everything you guys do. My question is very simply, uh, I'm 21 and how can I help out in this election cycle? I'm volunteering for Bernie Marino's campaign for the U.S. Senate and I know he's a great guy, but what else can I do to help out? Well, thank you. What's your name? My, my Ohio native. Evan. Evan. Thank you for coming out here, Evan, and you're 21 years old. The fact that you're asking that question is already a service to this country. I've endorsed Bernie, I've traveled to stand up. I'm going to see you, right with you, in our own state. Here's what I'll ask of every one of you. For those of you who have money, either you're running for office or you're going to support somebody good who actually is. Take that pocketbook out and actually support the people who can, but not just for money. You don't have money, you got time. Spread the message through your own effort. You don't care if you're knocking on one door, you're knocking on two, or you're making phone calls. However you're doing it, spread your own message. Just speak authentically for who you are. Don't speak on behalf of the Republican Party. 
speak on behalf of it. And I think we don't do that enough in our country today, right? We're taught the scripts that were handed from on high. Just tell the people what you as a citizen of this country actually believe. Tell the person next to you, you don't have to agree with 100% of what I say. It's just like I'm not going to agree with 100% of what you say. Find the people who disagree with you. The thing you really want to do to help this country in the next six months, all of you, is don't just talk to the people in this room. Don't just talk to your friends and family members and your neighbors who agree with you. Do it just like Donald Trump is doing. Show up in the places where you're not supposed to show up. Invite that neighbor who has that Biden sign in their front yard. Invite them over to dinner. And challenge them. Have an open debate, an open discussion at the dinner table. Emerge as a friend on the other side, but convince them and bring them along. That's what it's going to be required. It's one less vote for the other side, one more vote for ours. And if we start actually talking to the people who we're supposed to disagree with, what we might just discover is that we didn't actually disagree as much as we thought in the first place. That's how we're going to get this country back. That's how we're going to restore respect for every one of our citizens, regardless of their age or their skin color, or even whether they voted Democrat or Republican in the last election cycle. The question in this race, and I'll end with this, is are we actually one country or not? That's some valid system ever. If I asked that question 10 years ago, you would have said that was a silly question. Of course we're one country. Well, today we live in a country where you got people who consume one set of news from one place, one set of news from a different place. People who buy one type of coffee, people who buy a different type of coffee. The question right now for the country is, are we actually still one nation as the United States of America or not? I don't think the answer is obvious. But in my heart, I believe we still are. And I think this is our last chance to prove it in this country. And if every one of you starts speaking your mind in the open again, you will realize that, you know what? That artificial division, a lot of that is created by the media, designed to divide and conquer our people. At least 80% of us in this country are on the winning side of this war. Half the 20% are people younger than Evan and me who never learned those ideals in the first place. We're going to bring them along too. And we will still be a country whose best days are still ahead and has another 250 years and then some still left in our country's history. Thank you guys for coming out. God bless you and your family.